Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today for this webinar. And uh, what can I say? Predictions. Don't we all just love them? Especially predictions about what we believe would be popular and or effective in the future. Uh, I'm sure you've heard friends, colleagues, wax eloquent about NFTs or crypto or others speak about artificial intelligence and robotics and how they will take over the world. Or others still talk about climate change and renewable, sustainable sources of energy. And more recently with the pandemic, conversations have of course tended to center around online retail and remote work. And these are healthy conversations to have. And especially if individuals and companies are willing to commit money to it and bring a theme to life or to invest in it. So hello everyone, thank you for joining us for today's webinar where we take a closer look at what themes will define the decade. And before I introduce our guests, a bit of housekeeping for, uh, for everyone. Uh, the webinar today is due to last about 60 minutes. Uh, and if for any reason you log off or get logged off, uh, uh, you can use the same link that has been emailed to you to rejoin. We will have this available as a recording and it will be available on our social channels as well. So drop us an email if you'd like us to send you a copy. Uh, we will have plenty of time for questions and answers from our audience members. So do definitely type in and submit your questions in the Q&A box. You'll see it at the bottom of your screen. Um, and do feel free to participate, uh, you know, uh, uh, send us your questions. We will try to answer all of them or as many of them as time permits. Uh, but for those that we are not able to answer during the course of the webinar, we will definitely revert back to you uh, by email uh, after the webinar. So uh, don't be afraid, you will receive a response and an answer to your question from us. Um, with that, uh, kindly allow me to introduce our guest speakers for today. For today. Uh, first off, we have with us uh, uh, Esti. Esti is the head uh, of Miss Esti Dweck, Sorry, Esti is the head of global market strategy for Natixis Investment Managers Solutions. She has more than twelve years of experience in the financial industry, and before joining Natixis, she was a global strategist with the Emerging Markets team at Luma Sales and Company where her responsibilities included developing global macroeconomic and asset class views, as well as asset allocation ideas. Uh, she began a career in 2006 at HSBC Private Bank, where she worked in Geneva, New York, and Singapore with her last six years there as an investment strategist in London. As head of global thematics and macro research, Etsy is responsible for developing and communicating market research, macroeconomic views, investment ideas, and asset allocation positioning, as well as long-term return assumptions. Uh, these views help inform investment decisions across dynamic solutions portfolios. Uh, Ms. Dweck also holds a BA in political science from Princeton University. Esti, thank you for joining us and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you. Um, also with us from Netixis, we have Mr. Karen Karmundarian. Uh, Karen is a senior portfolio manager, thematics asset management uh, with Netixis. He is in line to be the chairman and CIO of the company. Karen will also be the co-manager of the thematics artificial intelligence and robotics strategy. He has 25 years of industry experience, both on the sell side and on the buy side, of which 12 years have been in managing global thematic equity funds. He notably created and managed the first of its kind robotics active fund in 2015. Uh, Karen holds a bachelor's degree in economics and a master's degree in banking and finance from Sorbonne University, as well as a business degree from the Institut d'Etudes Politiques Paris. Karen, thank you for joining us and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for the invitation and, and, and happy to be, to be here with you uh, this afternoon. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you. Uh, we also have with us today our very own Ms. Neelam, uh, Ms. Neelam Varma, who serves as the Vice President and Head of Investments uh, with the Continental Group. Neelam is a seasoned fi finance and banking professional with over 20 plus years of experience across investments, private banking and wealth management, corporate and commercial banking, real estate finance, retail banking and Islamic banking across India and the UAE. 
She holds an MBA finance from New Hampshire University in the US, is an advanced strategic management expert from uh, the IIM Ahmedabad. She also holds a mini MBA from Harvard Business School. She is a certified wealth manager from the American Academy of Financial Management USA and ICWM from CISI UK. Neelam, good evening and welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Anselm. Good to be here. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. All right. So uh, we have uh, hopefully done justice introducing you to our panel of um, uh, uh, experts. And uh, without wasting further time, uh, we are going to get right to the heart of it. The reason why we've got all of you here. And I'm going to go to, to Esti first uh, for a, an overview of the general market, the outlook, maybe a short term, medium or long term sort of look at uh, you know the what she's seeing, whether it would be with interest rates, equities, the geopolitical situation, COVID, and uh, you know we'll we'll go from there. Let's see. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, well, that that was a lot a lot of questions in one, uh, and could take up the entire webinar on its own. So I'll try <laughs> to maybe start from uh, where we are today, and, and also why. Uh, you know, when you think about the long term, you might have to think outside the box a little bit. Um, the, the short answer is that I remain constructive about the sort of short medium term outlook. So into the end of the year, as well as the multi year outlook. I know there are a lot of concerns uh, for investors today. Uh, between the Delta variant, the fact that we might be close to peak growth um, in some of the major economies, uh, valuations aren't cheap, the market's already performed very well since the beginning of the year. These are just a few of uh, you know, what we call the wall of worry that investors have to overcome when looking at the markets. Uh, and there is, I think, generally speaking, a bit of a fear that the markets have already rallied and they've we've not had a serious correction in such a long time that at some point it's due. Uh, so maybe I'll start by saying that I don't think valuations on their own are good enough reasons for markets to sell off. Uh, it doesn't mean we shouldn't keep an eye on them. It doesn't mean uh, they don't count at all. We want to make sure we don't fall into complacency. We want to make sure we don't ignore some of these risks. But just saying that the market expensive is expensive, so it has to correct, uh, hasn't really happened historically. You need some kind of catalyst. When I'm looking at the growth picture, I'm still confident about the second half of the year. Uh, let's think mostly US and China. China recovered the fastest. Five quarters to come out of the crisis, pretty much like 2008, 2009. And of course, now coming back towards its trend growth rates for the US, Q2 GDP uh, that's actually coming out this week is expected to be somewhere around 10%. And then that should sequentially decelerate a little bit as well. But slowing a little bit from extremely high levels does not mean that we're at the end of the cycle. And it doesn't mean that markets have to correct either. We have trillions in excess savings in the US. We have ongoing monetary and fiscal support. The vaccination effort stalled a bit, but seems to be picking up a little bit, maybe thanks to, to some of those Delta fears, or Delta variant fears and uh, support from policymakers. When you put all of that together, I find it difficult to have too negative of an outlook. So Again, maybe some hurdles, maybe a slightly bumpier second half of the year because uh, we maybe don't have the same visibility as we had in the first half uh, as we reopened, as vaccination happened. So many things uh, were basically expected. Maybe the easy part is behind us, uh, but it's, I would not underestimate the US consumer. I think elsewhere in the world, either vaccination is accelerating or reopening is gonna continue. So growth will pick up over there. And so again, the, the short answer is I remain constructive. That being said, and I don't wanna to spend too long, um, I'd say that one of the reasons we're here today is because more and more of our clients are starting to think that the very long-term multi-year outlook for some of the traditional asset classes or in the more traditional way of thinking could be a little bit more challenged. I didn't talk so much about rates, uh, I think the only thing I'll say is I don't think yields are going to go up as much as the market thinks they will. And I'm happy to take uh, that into more detail later. But this is why we're seeing clients think outside the box and look towards 
more them thematic investing, where there is more confidence into the longer term, and maybe you can ignore some of the shorter term volatility that could come in the next few months. Hmm. Well, thank you. And uh, I like the way you put it. Uh, but also, I'd just like to touch upon, I mean, how important do you think the you know, asset allocation is or the right asset allocation would be in, in this scenario? So asset allocation is important in every environment. And at the risk of sounding very corporate and, and talking about our own book, and it takes us, we're obviously always thinking about diversification. Uh, you can have preferences, you can have overweights, you can have uh, sort of niche uh, satellite allocations, but you want to have a diversified approach. And that's how I think you build lasting, durable portfolios for the longer term. So often there is this view of asset allocation depending on, on your age and how you should split your bonds and your equities. Yeah. I think that conversation has had to evolve a little bit because when your starting point is such low yields on the bond side, the return prospects are not particularly exciting over the next five or 10 years. And so that you know, cannot constitute the whole of your bond or, or just such a huge percentage of your portfolio. So you have to think elsewhere, potentially more defensive uh, equities, potentially mm -hmm. areas that tend to have more, I'd say dependable, sustainable earnings growth where you can see uh, the, the structural trends as a support. Um, but you, you do want to think of your portfolio holistically. You do want to think of what your objectives are. You want to think of how much uh, risk or volatility you can uh, stomach, if you, you'll pardon the word. Um, sure. And then with those clear uh, factors in mind, then you can move forward with your asset allocation. Absolutely. I think uh, a holistic portfolio and uh, taking into account the various factors that you've, you've uh, so so nicely put, uh, makes makes a lot of sense. I'm going to uh, jump to Neelam uh, with, you know, in terms of uh, your asset allocation and the percentages, how do you look at that when it comes down to constructing or when it, when it comes down to a portfolio? Well, uh, SD has answered quite a bit of this question, but yep. I'll repeat here. Uh, it's basically the decision on how you weight different assets in a portfolio and uh, essentially look at getting the best investment return for the amount of risk that uh, you're willing to accept. So proper allocation has immense potential to enhance your investment returns uh, mm -hmm. while lowering the portfolio volatility. Uh, as we spoke earlier, and ST has put in that, you know, the core portfolio today, which comprised of the traditional debt and equity is not in a position to give you the kind of returns that you would seek out. Uh, yeah. The satellite portfolio or the satellite allocations towards thematics completely is uncorrelated. It ignores the uh, demography. It, it actually excludes also quite a bit of the style. Uh, it excludes the market cap. It looks at identifying uh, emerging themes, potentially rewarding investment ideas, such as FinTech, biotech. We talk about medicine. It allows us to focus more on the emerging themes. That could be the drivers of the economy going forward. So uh, when we're looking at allocation in terms of thematics uh, in particular, the mm -hmm. idea is that it would be an attractive source of generating that alpha that we are seeking as uh, you know, investors. Uh, sometimes it does happen that investors can be slow in recognizing these. Uh, they can fail to possibly anticipate the power of a theme on a mm -hmm. long-term growth. Uh, it could be mispriced securities. So there's a lot that goes on. So we as a, you know, at Continental ensure that proper uh, asset allocation models are followed depending again on the risk appetite that an inv investor is looking at depending on the time horizon because traditionally the thematics tend to be, as we said, longer term in nature in terms of time horizon. So at uh, Continental while setting up or designing portfolios and creating asset allocations, we look at about 20% in a portfolio within the equity space that we mm -hmm. create uh, in terms of asset allocation. Sure, and uh, a quick sort of, uh, sort of to dive a little deeper into that. I mean, what what are your views on on asset classes? I mean, very often it's which one do you include, which one do you leave, or do you put everything in? So uh, how do you approach that? I mean, uh, Vilam, if you'd like to take that first, and then we'll get uh, Esti's view as well. Absolutely, I, I feel it is very very important to have all asset classes in a portfolio, unless there's a preference that uh, you know an investor would want to have. Uh, every asset class generates different returns and it reacts in a very different manner 
uh, in similar market conditions. So idea is to look at uncorrelated assets in the portfolio. We need to strike a balance between investing into a diverse area of assets, ensure uh, that we have enough time and resources to manage these investments. Uh, at Continental, we advise our clients to diversify their investments across various asset classes. Uh, the idea is to optimize their returns while managing the risk and this is active portfolio management. So uh, as such, the weightage of various asset classes in a portfolio is driven by the client's investment objective, the profile that he carries, the age bracket that he is in, the time horizon he has on hand, the risk tolerance or the risk appetite that he carries, and thereby allow him to capitalize on possibly the future trends and invest into uh, you know, different asset classes. So our objective is to look at as many asset classes possible unless and until uh, there's a specific preference. Uh, we would want to look at following the core of uh, the portfolio by following the risk tolerance and the objectives that the client has and basically look at prudent, responsible management of each portfolio. So uh, that's, that's the way we look at asset classes in a portfolio at Continental. Thank you, Anson. Thank you. Um... Esti, would you like to add uh, your views as well? So, not so much to add here. I agree that you want to have a diversified portfolio. You want to be invested across uh, a number of different asset classes. As I said, I think the starting point today for traditional bonds and equities uh, just means that uh, you're not going to get the types of returns you might be hoping for, uh, even for, I'd say, maybe a traditional 60-40 portfolio or something like that. So basically you need to top up, you need to enhance your portfolio. So there are different areas that we can look at, obviously uh, more satellite equity allocation, such as thematics uh, within the bond space, you know, whether you wanna look at some emerging markets, uh, get a little bit of yield. And of course, we're also starting to look and get our clients looking more and more at private assets. Uh, so you really just, you wanna fill the gaps and you wanna to try to increase your income, your yield, and ultimately your performance. And as Neelam was saying, without uh, or while staying within a specified risk band. So uh, a lot of these uh, less traditional uh, assets, you know, private debt, private equity, infrastructure, some of them are actually less volatile than what you would have traditionally. So you can get a little bit of this pickup in income, but not uh, have that much more uh, volatility coming with it. So you you want to you want to you want to think very broadly, uh, and you want to pick and choose and find these interesting opportunities to complement the more traditional uh, equity bond allocation that to, that could still be an interesting starting point. Sure, sure. Well, thank you for that. And uh, yep, uh, lots of things to talk uh, to think about as well. Uh, and while we give uh, our uh, team members some time to think, we have an audience poll that we have coming up. Uh, and I think it's an interesting one. So we've, we've touched upon a few themes and uh, the poll uh, that we'd like to get your views on are uh, which mega trends do you think will define the future? So there's ESG, uh, impact investing. We've got AI and technology. We've got safety, health and wellness. So um, unfortunately, uh, the hosts and the panelists cannot vote. So uh, we encourage each of you in the audience to, to sort of make sure that you get your vote in um, so that we can come back and get a sense of uh, you know, where uh, your opinion is uh, with regard to the future of uh, and the trends that we're gonna see in the future. Uh, while, we, uh, while we get our audience answering that, I have a, a reminder that you know, uh, we've got uh, these experts available uh, and who are kind enough to uh, join us uh, today. So, uh, please do feel free to ask your questions uh, and submit them in the Q&A box uh, so that we can uh, get those questions during the Q&A part of the webinar. All right. While uh, the audience is answering the questions, I am going to go to the next question. And we've touched upon uh, a little bit about you know, the current market situation, how it's changed, as well as uh, the interest in uh, thematics, and we saw uh, a little bit on the uh, the ESG and the uh, the aspect in the poll question that that's been making a lot of rounds with regard to uh, awareness with within both uh, audiences as well as companies. Um, Esti, would you like to elaborate a little bit on you know how do you see that evolving? 
Sure. So, so maybe let's separate that into into two things. And, and I know Karen will uh, will go into more detail on this, but sure. maybe to tackle the ESG question first. I think uh, we've really gone from a nice to have to a must have for the majority of our clients. Europe has clearly been in the lead, and regulation in Europe has helped with that. But you're seeing uh, Asia and the U.S. Uh, elsewhere in the emerging market. Everyone is really catching up. So ESG is I think going to become part of the general asset allocation conversation and not a niche pocket where you add a couple of funds uh, to say you have some ESG in the portfolio. It's really going to permeate the investment conversations more and more in the future. Now, what we're saying earlier is, obviously we had a pandemic, we had uh, you know the, the quickest, biggest collapse in markets and also the quickest recovery. And maybe one of the reasons you see investors worrying about a correction now is because we never got that second leg down last year. We recovered from end of March and have pretty much been going up since. And so I think there's just this feeling that can this, can this continue? Mm. Without giving an answer to that, I think this is why we're seeing more and more people think, well, if I don't have as much confidence in the next six months, or if some of my more traditional, I'd say standard regional equities and bonds, as we've been saying, have more challenged uh, return expectations over the next five or 10 years, then you start to think, where do I have that confidence that I am going to see the growth, I am going to see the earnings, and therefore I should see the performance over the next five or 10 years. We're seeing a bit of a view of wanting to enhance the portfolio and, and a bit look through some of these short-term uncertainties and question marks. And this is where strategies like thematic investing can come in. We're seeing that megatrends are everywhere. We're seeing that most of them have been accelerated and exacerbated by the pandemic. Most of them are technological, so it's, it's not a big surprise. Look at what we can accomplish now uh, from behind our computers. Uh, this was, you know, almost the the event that technology uh, that that was going to go towards technology. But when you think even before that, if you're thinking five, ten years out, we're going to be shopping, uh, consuming, working, communicating more and more online, and we weren't going to go backwards, right? We weren't going to stop Good. and suddenly think, wait going to find a parking spot and go shopping was better uh, than, than two clicks and something shows up on my doorstep tomorrow. Uh, so, so this is, you know, this is the, the easy one, but, and again, Karen will go into more details. You're really seeing structural changes in consumer behavior. You're seeing these structural changes be basically drivers of growth. And here for investors, you have this confidence that these structural changes are not going to reverse in the next five or 10 years. And so when you have uh, portfolio managers that have the ability to go pick and choose within this universe, uh, attractive opportunities, I think that's a great way of enhancing portfolios. No, absolutely. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And thank you for that. Um, I, I'd share a little bit of a personal uh, sort of uh, incident or story, uh, just underlying the point that you were making, right? With the adoption of technology, I just believe that, um, I, I, I'm trying to think of a better way to put it, but uh, it acted as a catalyst for, for adoption of technology. And there, there was a, a certainly uh, many of uh, our colleagues and many of colleagues in different offices and different companies that probably were sitting on the fence, not really giving, uh, adopting and getting into the thick of things with technology, had no other option but to sort of get used to it and, uh, you know, and uh, yeah, I don't think there's any going back. It will continue to change and evolve and uh, just go from there. I think we've got our response uh, for the audience poll. I'm curious to see. Uh, and Oh, okay. Uh, hmm, interesting. So uh, AI and technology, I think that gets the top vote, 71%. 26% uh, uh, of our audience thinks that ESG uh, impact investing will uh, be the, uh, the trend that defines uh, the future uh, with 3% on safety and no one voted for health and wellness. Wow, okay, that's surprising. But uh, uh, I mean, given the choices or given the alternatives, I think maybe you know everyone thinks that AI and technology, of course, is the buzzword. Uh, I'm going to go to Karen, but uh, Karen, before we uh, sort of, 
uh, get into it. Let's let's just take a step back and define you know, what is thematics. Uh, we've we've gone and we've sort of uh, uh, gone straight head first into the whole conversation. Uh, but for some of our audience members, uh, you know, let's let's give them a little bit more of an introduction into it. Sure, absolutely. Um, indeed, if you take a step back and, and think of what equity investing is all about. It, uh, in a sense, um, revolves around taking a view on, on the future of the asset class, of the market, um, of a part of this market, or on the prospects of, of specific companies, and then to assign a value to these uh, to these prospects, right? And the thing is that with an abundance of of, of research, data, opinions um, at our fingertips uh, in in today's fast-paced world, it's it's quite easy to fall into the trap of always trying to to locate the, the best tactics, the best strategies, or securities to buy at the, at a certain point in time. And, and at best, I mean, this this approach is going to be a, a patchwork system that that is about sure to be to fail, right? Um, and you need a, an overarching philosophy to bring this all together, uh, so that you, you you won't be uh, chasing one investment fad after the next, um, and, and losing money along the way. And that's where really I mean thematic investing comes in, um, mm -hmm. because they are based on, on what we know best about the future, uh, not necessarily the the near future as was mentioned, but really what our world will be transformed, how our world is going to be transformed, how it will look like due to these secular trends that are really um, uh, affecting the way we live, the way we work, the way we inform or entertain ourselves. And so the idea of thematic investing is really to uh, um, to really capitalize and leverage these, these uh, secular trends and, and benefit from them. And, and to me, I mean, there are two um, definitions of, of what thematic investing is. One, which is really what thematic strategies are not. Mm -hmm. which is really the fact that they don't fall into traditional allocation grids, silos, um, be it uh, regions, sectors, factors. Um, they really break away from, from market cap weighted indices, uh, which give more gravity, gravity to the winning industries uh, and companies of the recent past. Um, and actually, they, they usually are uh, unbenchmarked. Most of the time, uh, they don't have Morningstar peer groups. Um, and, and, and therefore, this is I mean, a kind of negative way to define what thematic strategies um, are. The positive way is really about um, the fact that, I mean, they, um, they, they, they rely on these secular trends and, mm -hmm. and, and really, I mean, what they do is, is really um, trying to benefit from them. Um, and if I were to use a, a kind of um, a nautical um, uh, metaphor, I mean, I would say that the themes are really the lighthouse. The mega trends or the secular trends that are underpinning these strategies are really the, um, let's say, your your roadmap, and and they they're really the, the tailwinds that you're benefiting from, and so they they use I mean you can use them to really avoid the cross currents and and really being drifted away, uh, and, and to make sure that I mean you stay focused on on what are going to be the really the um, uh, the the tailwinds that are going to benefit your your, your strategies, and in sure. doing so, you you design investable universes uh, based on these secular trends that already have a thematic alpha. And if mm. you're a good stock picker within these investable universes, you can add obviously the stock picking alpha to deliver obviously performance to your clients. Yeah, so I mean, you see it as being advantages as as an addition to to uh, you know to the traditional sort of uh, approach, and uh, I mean obviously. Uh, we are seeing uh, it it gain in popularity as well. I mean, there is there is a lot of uh, uh, conversations that that are centered around it. And why do you think that is? The, the fact that I mean, they they're gaining in popularity is that really they they offer first uh, compelling investment opportunities. Or said differently, I mean, they they benefit from the potential long term growth uh, inherent to investing in in world changing forces. Obviously, uh, you identify these investment tailwinds as, as I just said. Um, and I think also um, the fact that, I mean, investors are increasingly recognizing the that traditional ways of approaching equity investing, whether they are sector-based or geographical-based allocations, are no longer really in sync with, with today's market and corporate reality. Just think of an investor who would like to invest in, in, in the FANGs, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, what would appear as, as a very straightforward way to, to invest in the FANGs would be maybe to, uh, to, to buy an IT exposed tracker, right? The thing is that, I mean, if you look at, I mean, how these companies are classified, I mean, this is very arbitrary today. 
think of the MSCI gig sectors, um, what you, you realize is that in your uh, MSCI world index, the, the fangs have dispersed into three main indices. The consumer discretionary sector, which now houses Amazon, information technology, and now home to Apple, and you have the recently created media and entertainment uh, uh, gig sector, which has opened its doors to uh, Facebook, Alphabet, and Netflix, for instance. So okay. when you buy an IT um, tracker, for instance, you don't get exposure to these companies. Mm. So, um, I mean, the underlying risk and your exposure is, 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 is not really what you would like it to be. And the same goes for the S&P, for instance. It's, it's, it's the same. And from mm. a a geographical perspective, I mean, that's the, the same the same thing because of globalization, because these companies are very global in nature. Um, when you buy, let's say, um, a US equity uh, tracker or an ETF, for instance, um, the thing is that, I mean, you're not getting exposure to the US market per se. You're getting exposure to US domicile companies that have operations all over the world. And so you, you need a, a different way to approach um, your equity investment and to have a better uh, grasp of, of your uh, underlying uh, risk exposure. And that's where I mean really thematic and the value chain of a theme makes more sense, especially if you have a high purity in your portfolio. Uh, uh, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we are going to go uh, to an audience poll uh, and it should be coming up uh, on screen. And I've been told by the team that this time the the, the the host and panelists are allowed to vote, so you can get your vote in. Uh, please feel free to click in, as well as our audience members. Um, the, the poll question is on your screen. What is your main objective for looking at thematic investment strategies? Uh, is it to enhance investment returns, include a more innovative or disruptive uh, investment approach, increase diversification, or believe you believe in the theme and its long-term potential? So, so please do, uh, submit your uh, uh, your choice for the poll question, and we'll come back to the answers quite shortly. Uh, but I'm going to dig a little deeper. There are a couple of topics from the last poll question that stood out: artificial intelligence, robotics, as uh, you know, so uh, as as being the themes uh, that are most likely to sort of change the future, if you will. Uh, and uh, the the question I've got to to you, Karen, and then uh, Esti, to you as well, is uh, you know AI robotics. They seem to have gone from uh, being science fiction to uh, to buzzwords, and now to things that we see impacting us every day. I mean, I can cite so many instances that that we can see this at play. Um, what role do you see AI and robotics playing in this digital age? I mean, how do you see this evolving? Would you uh, like to Karen, start? I, please. Okay, I start. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, to me, I mean, uh, artificial intelligence is uh, what I call a general purpose technology, um, uh, mm -hmm. i.e. Uh, a technology that has the power to affect most parts of our societies and, and in a very short uh, period of time. And it's also very disruptive. Um, uh, and I use the, the word disruptive uh, quite carefully because in my view, it differs from other advancements uh, because you can have iterative advancements, which consist in doing um, uh, the same thing in a more efficient way. You have innovation, which consists in doing new things, and you have disruptive technologies, which are really um, consist in doing new things that are really uh, making the old ones obsolete. Um, so with all the implications in terms of risk, in terms of stranded assets, and, and what this means for some companies' legacy, legacy sectors. Um, and, and to me, I mean, uh, AI uh, is really, um, uh, the basis for for this this uh, this robotics revolution as well, and this is I mean all about um, more and more connected devices. I mean think of 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 how many uh, devices we have connected to the to, to the net. Uh, in 2010 we had 8.8 .8 billion. Uh, in 2015 in 2020 we had 21.5 billion, and it's predicted that we we will have in about 40 billion uh, in 2025. And all these uh, data, uh, all these uh, devices are generating more and more data. We were talking about two zettabytes of 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 of, uh, of data in uh, in 2010. So zettabytes are 10 to the power 21. So a massive amount of data. Um, one zettabyte is about 250 billion of DVDs uh, in terms of capacity, and we we will probably be at 175 in in, in five years time. 
The thing is that we have also computing power, which is obviously helping us process all this data and also um, helping to, to make these AI algorithms and systems more sophisticated and more capable. And what this brings is that, I mean, you, you can um, embed these technologies into robotic devices to help us in many, many tasks, whether they are physical tasks in on the manufacturing floor, but more and more into um, um, uh, cognitive task. And that's mm -hmm. where you see this technology really permeating, as, as Esti was saying um, uh, a bit earlier, I mean, different verticals of the economy and most of the of the economy, to, 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 to be honest, uh, and really changing the way we think we, we do things and how they, they can assist, I mean, people in, in improving their, their, their efficiency in doing things differently. Um, I mean, this is going to have a, a massive, massive uh, uh, implication for for different uh, different uh, verticals of the economy. So so to me, I mean, that's where uh, I, I see that um, as a, as a big change and a big challenge because I mean, this is going to happen in a very um, uh, in a very short period of time. You said, I mean, um, I mean, it was something of science fiction because obviously the first iteration you have when you have. Um, you know, if you if you if you believe in the in the Moore's law of doubling of capacity, uh, mm. the first iterations of improvements, I mean, are pretty um, unnoticeable. But when yeah. you come to the tenth, to the fifteenth, or the twentieth iteration of the Moore's law, that's where you are on this uh, very exponential part of the curve, and where you see, I mean, the, the drastic changes that are really now materializing in the, I mean, in in your day to day life, in a sense. Absolutely, absolutely, uh, Esti. So it's difficult to add so much because Karen was so uh, thorough, but maybe one way to think of it is looking at corporate America today. What mm -hmm. we've seen uh, is that businesses have become leaner and meaner throughout the pandemic. They adapted uh, to having less employees and social distancing and other things. And what we're hearing from most of them is that they want to invest and they want to invest into automa automation. They want to invest in robotics. Uh, as Karen was saying, often that means you need some kind of AI to go with it. Um, but you know, a couple of months ago, and we've moved a bit past that, but there was this view that they couldn't find employees. But in a way, corporates thought, well, if we don't get as much labor force back, then we find another way of producing that might probably cost us even less in the longer term. So again, I think it's gone from, as you were saying, so whether it's the science fiction or, or robots or Tom Cruise movies uh, that you know maybe felt a bit scary, the, the little by little, it is becoming part of everyday life, even in aspects uh, that we don't necessarily think of or we wouldn't think to put that definition in. But as a business, uh, this is becoming the norm and probably one of the smarter ways of, uh, of moving forward. So again, long-term structural secular changes uh, from businesses that are going to continue to support uh, the shift towards uh, AI and robotics. Thank you so much. And um, absolutely, I couldn't agree more with you. Uh, and uh, Karen, what you mentioned just reminded me of, uh, of uh, you know, the internet in its early days. And uh, we had modems with, uh, with I think, 9.6 kbps was probably the, the yeah. maximum baud rate we would get. And today, that's, uh, I mean, we've come uh, a, a, a mile away from, from there. But yeah, we can definitely see that happening with AI as well as with, uh, with robotics. And uh, I'd like to also say hello and welcome to Mr. Shok Sardana, our founder and managing director. Thank you for joining us, sir. Hi, how are you? Very well. Uh, I've thank you. I've been enjoying the conversation. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we've got the results of the poll. Let's uh, let's have that on screen. Let's let's. Uh, there you go. We've got uh, the main objective for looking at thematic investments from our audience. Um, a lot of them believe in the theme and its long-term potential. Uh, that's an excellent audience that we've got. Very woke and very clued in. Uh, very happy with that. Uh, some of them. Uh, are okay. The next uh, next highest is increasing diversification, followed by enhancing investment returns, and uh, include a more innovative or disruptive investment approach. Uh, has got about a thirteen percent share. Um, we have another poll that we can uh, get to whenever the team is ready. Um, if you can have that up on screen and. 
There we go. What percentage of your portfolio are you looking to diversify um, your investments into thematic funds? So it can go from 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 40, or 40 to 50%. Uh, and we will come back to those answers shortly. Uh, but while the audience is answering uh, the poll, I'd like to get into a little more of a practical uh, sort of question. Uh, we've gone into the, the themes and you know uh, we've delved a little more into what we see as uh, the, the future impact, especially of uh, some technologies like AI and robotics. Um, how would you in integrate uh, you know thematics into traditional portfolios? What would your approach be? Uh, we'll go with you, ST first, and then we can go to Karen post that. Sure. Uh, so this goes back to the asset allocation conversation we had at the beginning. I think for a lot of investors, your starting point is something like 60, 60, 40. And then within your equity allocation, you're probably thinking MSCI world breakdown by regions. And then you play around that. Maybe you want to have a couple of sector views. So really, for me, this comes on top of that. Um, and again, I'm sure Karen will, will mention more of this. But the uh, maybe one of the advantages or the perceived advantage from my point of view of uh, thematic investing is you don't have to have the geographic allocation. You, you get to choose those opportunities regardless of where they are around the world. So it kind of goes on top of um, having some regional views and having some allocations, but this is uh, the next step in that conversation. So I would really just add it um, as allocations. The other thing, and, and we've talked more about AI and robotics today, but throughout most of the megatrends, um, there's really ways that you can either dial up or dial down, I'd say, the cyclicality of the allocation. So some megatrends are going to be much more defensive. Some are going to be more cyclical. So there's also a way to, to be maybe a little more tactical. So if you have this, this pocket uh, for thematic investing, then within that, uh, you can either diversify further and just think over the long term, I believe in all these themes, like the, the poll said that that was one of the main reasons. Um, but you can also choose to have a little bit more or less in some of these more cyclical uh, trends, depending on what the investment environment and the business cycle is looking like. Oh. Aaron? Yes, I mean, if I can add to, to Esti's point, I mean, from my experience, I mean, thematic funds can be positioned in portfolios through, I mean, three main approaches, uh, basically, depending on, on, on investor requirements and preferences. The first one is really in a core satellite um, construction, um, portfolio construction process, mm -hmm. whereby um, our clients, I mean, complement and enhance the core of their portfolio with targeted, most of the time, single theme or a combination of single theme strategies uh, as satellite. Um, and, and that's meant to be a, a performance kicker and a diversifier. The second approach that we see is, is a hybrid one where, whereby thematic strategies are, are either using a single uh, or, or, or a multi-theme funds um, are incorporated into the global equity sleeve along investments uh, following traditional investment grades, uh, regional sectors, et cetera. And for many, for, for, for many investors, uh, the, the multi-thematic strategies can help manage inherent cycle dynamics and, and changes in risk. And the third one is, is really um, something which is increasing in, in, in gaining in traction is really to, 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 um, to have the first uh, approach um, turned upside down, whereby mm. you use thematic strategies because they are long-term by design, long-term in nature, uh, as the core of your um, of your of your equity exposure, and then you complement that with um, tactical bets, whether they are sector based or they are geographic based, to complement because you want you have a certain view, a top down view on market dynamics. So this is something which is gaining in traction, especially with with institutional investors. Thank you. Um, yeah, makes sense. Uh, interesting to sort of look at and. Uh, think about which ones uh, can be adopted or which combinations make the most sense for each individual advisor, of course. Uh, if you if you do have questions on that, if you'd like to explore that further, do feel free to reach out to your advisor uh, to discuss that out. Uh, we have one more question, I think, before we go to uh, the questions from the audience. And uh, I'm going to try and sort of uh, pick each of your brains uh, a little on that. So we've gone through many of the, the themes, many of the trends. 
And what I'd like to get is uh, is from you. I mean, do you have uh, you know a, a set of trends that you think uh, that we should watch out for in the next uh, five, ten years? Uh, and uh, or if you have your, your top three or your favorite trends, whichever way you'd like to look at it. But uh, if you can get some views from you, uh, starting with uh, with you, Esti, and then we go to Karen, and then we go to uh, Neelam as well. Uh, I was just going to copy Karen's answers uh, since he's the expert. Uh, I guess I'll have to come up with my own. Um, I mean, again, not not because Karen's on the call. I think anything that has to do with technological developments, with online uh, communication, uh, consumption, all of that is absolutely going to continue. Obviously, uh, when you think, uh, and robotics and AI is very broad, right? So this, again, permeates so many different, uh, different sectors. Um, I remember, and again, Karen can give you the figures, but I remember chatting with uh, one of uh, Karen's colleagues a couple of years ago saying if how much added sort of gadgets and, and AI and safety tools were in a car compared to five or 10 years ago, the, the worth of that um, you know, value added in your car today, and, and that number was just so big and at the same time so small compared to what it's going to be over the next five or 10 years. So any technological advances across uh, a lot of different sectors, I think, are going to do very well. And again, I don't necessarily separate out ESG, but anything that's going to be uh, more with, I guess, the green revolution, I think, will we'll continue to do well in the coming years. Thank you. Uh, Karen, over to you. Yeah, thank you. And I concur with, with SD in the, in, the, in the sense that I mean, to us, um, obviously, the um, everything that has to do with climate change is going to become I mean, more and more um, important going forward, and and, mm -hmm. um, and this is also leading, I mean, to a flurry of new funds that are uh, based on net zero commitments, climate benchmarks, Paris Agreement aligned uh, investment opportunities, etc. So I, I think that's really important. But I mean, this is not a, uh, about funds that are only focused on energy transition or uh, let's say renewable uh, energy only. I mean, the way we design our thematic strategies is always to make sure that we have the whole value chain. And we always have also uh, an investable universe that uh, is diversified in terms of sectors, in terms of verticals of the economy, in terms of, um, uh, let's say, cyclicality, in terms of defensiveness, so that we can really manage these portfolios over the cycles and over the market phases um, and to deliver performance and protect performance when, when necessary. Uh, so that's something which I mean, investors have to keep in mind is not to go for too concentrated themes where, I mean, you were exposed to one driver only. Um, so climate change is one. I'm, I'm surprised that wellness is, is not so much uh, in favor uh, among, among the audience. Uh, I mean, we've just launched a wellness fund uh, a few months back, and we think mm -hmm. that to, to Esti's point sir, about the um, changes in consumption, uh, this is something which is, I mean, materializing fast because we're living longer and we want to live in a, um, take less risk because we're living longer and we want Absolutely. to live in a healthier, uh, with, I mean, more healthily. And, and this is really changing, I mean, um, the way we, we behave, the way we, we consume. And this is also changing the business models of many companies. And so we think that this is something just starting and that will uh, gain in, in, in importance over, over the foreseeable future. Um, and 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 really, all the technologies are, are going. I mean, this is probably the the most powerful um, mega trends of of the four that we uh, I've we've, we've identified. So, demographics, uh, social um, um, technological change, um, resource scarcity, and and globalization. This one is the short term. The, the one that has the most impact on over the short term. But this is going to permeate different themes in, in different ways. So yeah, definitely uh, climate change and wellness uh, to me are the mm. two I mean to consider. Knowing that ESG to us is not a theme per se, this is mm -hmm. something we um, incorporate in, in the way we, we do things. So not only in terms of what we put in our portfolios, but how we construct the portfolio, how we size sure. the positions and how we engage with the companies. This is a tool, this is not the end the end game. It's a tool that we use really to, um, to, to, to select the companies within attractive themes. Uh, but it's not a thing per se. 
makes yeah absolutely makes complete sense uh, i think more and more companies are going to go towards adopting esg as the foundation of uh, the foundational principles on what they yeah. operate on yeah. yeah. so uh, yep yeah, uh, equally surprised as you that the health wasn't uh, yeah, was but, but but i think it's probably like you correctly pointed out it's probably early days yet and many people may not have considered it as a sort of uh, as a theme uh, which is fantastic because you know uh, we are all become more health conscious um, and it gives us a entry into the opportunity at an early stage. So, uh, sorry, uh, Neelam, please go ahead. I completely echo the trends that have been outlined by ST and Karen. I think uh, uh, technology is what uh, we are looking at in uh, in a big way in the next 10, 15, 20 years. You just mentioned the change of the way modems work now, the kind of GBPS that we see on the internet. I think 200 is too less a number now, uh, given the fact that we have multiple instruments working across our households across our office spaces. Uh, the trends uh, as we see uh, that are gaining a lot of traction from our investors are definitely ESG. We see a lot of interest coming in uh, e-commerce. We see a lot of interest coming in EV, which uh, I think was strangely missed out. Uh, hmm. A lot of 5G, we see climate change, we see water uh, as one of the mega trends. And we see a lot of interest coming in from our uh, investors on uh, water. Of course, mm. AI and robotics remains one of the key factors in uh, today's market. And a lot of investors are coming in uh, with their interest in these themes. Uh, with this, uh, Anselm, I would like to take the opportunity of introducing Mr. Ashok Sardana, who's Please. here with us on the panel. Uh, Mr. Sardana uh, is the founder and managing director of Continental Group. He has been advising clients on a wide range of financial planning solutions for over 40 years having extensively worked with high net worth and ultra high net worth families across the globe, uh, across all areas of life insurance and legacy planning. He is one man who I've seen who continuously seeks to find uh, more thoughtful and effective ways to help his clients uh, so that they can live the best life that they can ever imagine. Uh, Mr. Sardana arrived in Dubai in 1977 and uh, as such, selling insurance products was not a part of his plan. He uh, actually started off at a contracting company, having been paid only 13 dirhams uh, per day. And to make ends meet, he started working as a part-time insurance agent, where I, I think he developed the real passion that I see personally for this profession. Uh, I, I, he joined Alico and he served about 17 years uh, at Alico, building a very, very loyal customer base. But uh, again, you know, the entrepreneur in him wanted to see that he could help his clients even more uh, and enjoy the freedom to do things the way he would want to do across different uh, providers. And this is what led to the inception of Continental in the year 1994. Uh, Continental uh, basically aims at providing uh, solutions across various financial products. Uh, and he was the one who ensured that financial planning solutions and options are available to clients with absolute flexibility and great transparency and disclosure. Uh, Mr. Sardana is a lifetime member of the Million Dollar Roundtable and has been a top of the table qualifier for over 20 years. Uh, his views and thoughts on insurance and financial services in the UAE are very much sought after and are published across newspapers and radio talk shows. Uh, welcome, Mr. Sadana. We would like to hear from you. And my question to you is, what changes have you witnessed during the last five years around you when you meet with clients? Have you seen any major shift in the mindset in the last two years with the pandemic uh, underway and the way work is happening around us? What is the transformation that you see? Uh, thank you, Neelam. Uh, I wasn't prepared for this question because I prepared some, <laughs> some, uh, some other, what I, uh, I wanted to say. Anyway, uh, I don't know about five years, but I can tell you for the last 40 years, 50 years, the changes that have come about. I remember watching a James Bond movie. I don't know if you, and, Uh, and, uh, he was traveling in the car and he, the, the, the letters or the, the script was coming behind the car. And I said, you remember the movie, uh, Anselm? Uh, and I said, wow, you know, this is, this is amazing. And uh, I remember 
I, I remember reading in the papers that very soon the cars will come when it rains, the wipers will start uh, moving themselves. And I said, no, this is this cannot be possible. How would how would the windscreen know that it's raining? And uh, so so things are changing. Like you said, five years. Zoom is not a communication uh, mode. Zoom has become a transportation mode. Mm. Today you could be sitting anywhere, and we could be having a conference. So those are the changes which have come about, and they've come about so so fast that we didn't even realize how soon they were coming. You were talking about, no one is uh, talking about the wellness fund. Uh, Peter Diamandis, uh, you know, he, I've, I've met him a couple of times. He has a, a program where he takes a team of five, 10 people in the US and they go to the best hospitals, best clinics and where the new technology is being uh, being developed for longevity. And people were asked, you know, how long do you think you're gonna live? And most of the people said between 120 and 140 years. They used to say <laughs> death and taxes are the only thing which are certain. Now they say only, only taxes are certain. We don't <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, we have to diversify and also one of the things which I'd like to say is don't get scared when the market goes down. You know, the problem is that we invest and suddenly the market goes down and we start panicking what's happening. If the market has gone down, it will go up. And if the market has gone up, one day it has to come down. That's the nature, nature of investments. We just have to stay invested. We have to have the confidence in the market. Every time something happens, when 9-11 happened, they said, no, 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 this time is different. America has never been attacked. When 2008 the crisis happened, uh -uh, this time is different. Citibank, company like Citibank and AIG have never gone bankrupt. How can, how can this be possible? So every time something happens, people say this time is different. Yeah, it is different, but the market always bounces back. So have the confidence in the market and uh, stay invested, diversify, and enjoy the ride. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Sadana. You. Anselm, I would like to go to you now and say, ask you a simple question. How do you see Continental go through this change? How is it adapted to the digital age? Okay, I'm going to take that, uh, that question. I'll give you an overview, but I think first let's go to the poll results. I'm curious to see what and how much our audience members are uh, planning to diversify into thematics and okay there we have it uh, about 10 to 20 percent uh, 57 percent of our audience uh, is looking at uh, uh, adding in thematic funds into their portfolio followed by about 20 to 40 percent and uh, then about zero to ten percent followed by yeah so I think that's uh, that's probably a good sensible uh, sort of number to look at uh, and, and and a good way so uh, a good approach to have. Uh, I first before I answer my question, I'm going to uh, uh, have I have a request for all of our attendees and for our panelists. We uh, seem to be running out of time. I think uh, the topic has been very interesting and the conversations have been uh, fantastic. Uh, and time has passed so quickly. I'm going to request you if we can uh, uh, extend this by about ten minutes more. If you're okay, we will go ahead with that. Uh, and hopefully we'll uh, you know, be able to take some of the audience questions that we've got. Uh, I'm going to try and give you a quick summary, Neelam. Uh, from a perspective of uh, a change and transform transformation on the digital side, as a business, I can identify with many of the, uh, uh, many of the, um, the views shared by both ST as well as uh, Karen. We've added uh, to our workflow so many elements and aspects of technology of digitization whether it is uh, you know, uh, RPA or robotic uh, process automation to improve efficiencies, or, or whether it is looking at predictive analysis and using AI and ML uh, in terms of trying to identify buying behavior or you know, uh, uh, how to serve clients better. Uh, so we are definitely adopting and adding in many of the, uh, the from, especially from a technological uh, standpoint, many of these newer emerging uh, ideas uh, into our business. And we can see that it's not going to go away. It's only going to sort of get uh, get bigger uh, as, we, as, as we go along. 
Um, the other aspect um, of it uh, that I'll also touch upon is the ESB, ESG part. As a business, we certainly have uh, realized that it's extremely important for us to be able to embrace those values, uh, to be able to be an organization that supports sustainability, whether it is you know, starting with uh, as something as simple as cutting down the usage of paper in our offices, uh, to getting to more uh, uh, bigger uh, th things with regard to social impact and how we can look at you know uh, providing education to underprivileged uh, members of society, etc. So uh, definitely the themes that that are there, I, I, we can see them, and I can see those themes in action uh, in our in, in our own firm, right? So we can extrapolate it from there, and we can see that yes, every company would be looking at uh, at adopting and adding these into into their uh, business life cycle into their sort of uh, future plans as well uh, i hope that uh, sort of gives you a little bit of uh, an answer uh, yes thank you so much thank you Anselm. thank you um i'm going to go to our audience questions so that we uh, can get to some of them uh, as quickly as possible as i mentioned before we will send you an email with uh, the response if you're not able to get to your question today the first question that we have uh, most indices today are heavily weighted towards tech hmm. how does in how does investing in tech theme funds help with diversification all right so i think uh, uh, karen or uh, esti uh, one of you if you'd like to take this Maybe I can start. Um, Please. Yeah, I mean, it, it revolves again. I mean, to the I mean, to the point I was ma making earlier that I mean, theme funds need to be um, diversified in terms of verticals, in terms of drivers, in terms of different sectors. For instance, AI and robotics. Uh, our fund is exposed to obviously um, the the uh, uh, automation of, of the factory, but also to medical automation, to service automation, and and also some of the consumer products. So you, you uh, and the thing is that I mean, typically, I mean, the way you design your strategies is very important. For instance, if I if I take I mean our strategies, typically they have ninety five percent or above um, active share when you compare them to MSCI world or MSCI or country. Because I mean, the, the way you want to construct this, uh, this strategy is to focus them on uh, small mid cap companies that are, are not so much present in the uh, in the uh, traditional indexes and that will, that, that will become uh, over, the, over, over the, the medium to long term, let's say the, the big weights uh, of these indexes uh, five, 10 years down the road. So. The, the fact that I mean they, they they are not present in these major indexes. If you have already exposure to global equities, using trackers, ETFs, or or global uh, funds, um, the fact of adding these uh, thematic strategies because of this high active share and because of their focus on on small mid caps most of the time at least at the thematics, will bring this diversification that I mean uh, we were talking about. Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, uh, Esti, would you like to add anything, or we go to the next one? Let's go to the next one. We're short on time. Uh, thank you so much. All right, we have the next one. And okay, maybe it's, uh, Esti, you can take this. How AI can be put put to use by normal individual investors? Hmm, interesting. Oof, uh, I'm I'm not sure what uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by put to use. Um, I, I think we're I think we use it. And and again, maybe Karen is better place to answer. I think we use or there's AI around us in a lot more areas than we realize or than we think. So uh, maybe it's not a question of how do we want to use it. It's just a question sure. of uh, looking at where it's present and how uh, how broad uh, it, uh, it has become. And then again, thinking more from an investment opportunity, are there uh, certain players that we, you know, that you can benefit from having an allocation to? Yeah, I think that uh, question is a little more clarifying so that we can get a better answer to it. Uh, but yes, uh, we will go to our next question, which I think is an interesting one as well. Um, and it's coming up on screen. Uh, so talking about a thematic portfolio, if you had to pick two categories or sectors, what would these be and why? So uh, I think we got a little bit of this uh, uh, answered already. Uh, but if you had to pick two uh, uh, sort of uh, sectors, which would they be? Uh, uh, we'll go to Karen and then to you, Esti. So uh, the, the way I understand the question is, I mean, what, what themes, right? Uh, that would be? Yes. yes. Uh, sectors, I think, is what they use the term. Uh, well, if, if, if we're, I mean, traditional sectors, yeah. sectors, that would be probably, um, yeah, 
information technology and communication services, probably. I mean, that would be more tech heavy, uh, definitely. Um, and if I wanted, I mean, something different, but that would be probably industrials. Thank you. Esti? So, so I was thinking more in terms of themes, but I think the answers would be very similar. And, and again, I've said it earlier, anything that's about the technological revolution or the green revolution, uh, and again, it can be across sectors, but picking and choosing those opportunities, I think that's what is going to be uh, present for the next five, 10 years, at Perfect. the very least. Thank you. Uh, we'll take two more questions. Uh, and okay, the, the that's on screen is, is thematic investment strategy considered to be high risk as we will be depending on a specific idea or theme? Hmm, interesting, okay. Uh, Esti, we'll go to you first. Sure. Uh, so, so I think the short answer is no, in the sense that the themes are very broad and mm. you can, within a theme, there are a lot of different ways of investing in that theme and approaching that theme. Uh, so, so, and again, Karen might, might have more details on that, but uh, you know, even if you think AI, there's so many different ways of playing that or robotics, which maybe we're, we're all, we feel more familiar with. Uh, so you can be diversified within a theme, and then there are plenty of different themes to play. So uh, I don't think concentration is a concern. The question of risk, and I think that we addressed this a little bit earlier, is yep. some themes or some parts of themes can be more uh, cyclical and some can prove more defensive. Uh, and so I think you have the ability to, to balance that out in portfolios, which means that it doesn't turn uh, into a higher risk strategy. If anything, almost to the contrary, because normally these are very long-term growth drivers. And as we said, if they don't reverse, uh, even if it takes a little longer to work, they should work. I mean, to, to, to complement ASD's answers, I mean, um, I mean, I, I, obviously, I agree, and 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 the way we see that, I mean, at, at thematics, is, is it very much depends on 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 how the, the strategy has been designed, uh, because mm -hmm. you can have, I mean, thematic products that are very concentrated, so very high octane and very high risk and and quite volatile. You can have have also, I mean, themes that are very broad based and and where you. Do, that are not really based on secular trends where you have, I mean, thousands of companies within the investable universe. So they're obviously their, their characteristics are very different. The way we design them, obviously, in terms of uh, multiple sectors, multiple verticals, help to lower this, this, these risks to diversify. Uh, and if you take a, a, a fund like AI Robotics at Thematics today, um, its uh, level of volatility is lower than that of the MSA old country, for instance, despite the fact that it's quite tech heavy uh, because of, of this um, diversity of, of sectors and verticals. Uh, we have quite significant exposure to medical automation, for instance, or mm. to some of the consumer oriented um, companies, which I mean, helps uh, bringing down that level of risk to a very manageable level. Sure. Well, thank you for that. Um, and we've got one last question that we will take, and that's up on screen. Um, uh, okay, it goes, one of the challenges in uh, thematic funds is that by the time these trends are identified and funds are created, you already have a substantial run-up in the prices. This seems to be a challenge uh, to me. Hmm. Uh, interesting point there. Uh, again, we'll go to, we actually, we'll get, we'll get the views from all three of you. Uh, uh, Karen, can we start with you and then uh, SC and then Nilo? It's true that, I mean, if you want to properly design a thematic strategy and to make sure that you have all the requirements, I mean, to be able to manage these, uh, these funds over the, over the medium to long term, um, it, it requires some time. I mean, for us, I mean, from the time we identify an attractive theme to the, to the time when we launch it on, on the market, it takes pr pr probably um, 10 to 12 months. So obviously, I mean that's 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 a long time. Uh, nonetheless, I mean I'm, I mean I've I've launched the the, the first robotic funds in, in 2015, and, and today six years uh, from 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 then, um, I mean the theme is just I mean still nascent, and, and the potential for for the, for the theme is, is still there. Um, valuations are, are obviously obvious above the the, the market, but uh, they've always been. Uh, and nonetheless, I mean, the, uh, the growth of these companies and, and their earnings power has, has also moved in sync so that, I mean, we can find still very attractive uh, uh, opportunities in these themes. Uh, what, what really matters is that, I mean, you have a theme which is really um, 
that that has the potential to to survive over the, the medium to long term. I mean, you were mentioning uh, electric vehicles and and some strategies that we've seen in the market. To us, I mean, that's a, a bit riskier, obviously, because these these strategies can be um, uh, put into question uh, by by a new development. Let's say, I mean, electric vehicles. Who knows if I mean tomorrow the hydrogen cars will not I mean disrupt I mean these electric vehicles, so we don't want to be in a position where we go to back to clients and saying you know in two years or three years time from now, you know what I mean the strategy that we have offered to you is is no longer valid, but what we can uh, offer you instead is 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 something which is uh, based on hydrogen for instance. And the fact that, I mean, you have this craze around these very fashionable uh, strategies like EV, like space for some time, um, that's where, I mean, you, you, you create some uh, valuation bubbles. Uh, so that's where, I mean, the risk lies. I mean, to us, if you have a, a, a valid strategy for the medium to long term, you will you always find, I mean, attractive opportunities in, in a diversified set of, of companies and different verticals. Thank you. Um, Esti? So, so I think the definition of megatrends means very, very long-term changes. And that means that it shouldn't be priced in within six months or a year, even if it takes a little bit of time to market. These are trends that should be unfolding over five, 10, potentially 20 years. So if it's a proper long-term megatrend, then these thematic strategies have plenty of time. The other, as, as Karen mentioned a bit earlier, is the idea for, for some of these managers is also to find smaller and medium-sized companies, not just the mega caps. Now you can argue, uh, and we don't have time, but about the fangs. And uh, when you look at the last few years, clearly, and when you look at the earnings just that were announced this week, clearly there's still so much growth potential, even though they might seem like it's obvious or priced in, I think it's not. But if you go to some of the smaller firms, then really they have the potential to develop into something a lot larger. Uh, and so I think when you put all those together, it ultimately kind of comes down to active management. You want to trust, um, and I'm not saying this because Karen's on the call, but you want to trust the portfolio managers that know uh, their sectors, that know their themes, and that are going to find opportunities that they still think are attractively uh, priced. So I agree, things that are too trendy right now, if everyone's going into the same stuff, that can get priced in a little bit more. But the whole point of this is finding the longer term opportunities and finding uh, the companies that haven't been uh, so obviously looked at by everyone in the market. That makes sense. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Leela? Uh, clearly, the, uh, the message that is coming across is thematic investing is meant for clients who have a long term time horizon on hand and who have a view that uh, the investments that they're getting into are going to generate decent uh, out of the market returns. Uh, the way I would look at it is that go with your financial advisor. Uh, they are the ones who would be able to pick up these trends early on and uh, take their advice, go ahead and look at a portfolio allocation that suits your requirements, suits your objectives. And uh, I, I think it's important in addition to trusting your fund manager, also trust your financial advisor. He is the one who would be able to identify those picks then offer to you as a part of the uh, solution that you're seeking. So uh, sure. my, my answer to this is clearly trust the fund, uh, fund manager and trust the uh, advisor. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and you know a big thank you to uh, each and every one of you, to Natixis, to SD, Karen for joining us today, sharing their knowledge, experience, and thoughts with us. Also, a uh, very big thank you to, uh, to you, Neelam, and uh, boss, uh, to Mr. Shok. Uh, and most of all, to you, all of you are attendees. I am not going to thank you for your time, uh, no, but I will say a huge thank you to each of you for your attention. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful evening and I hope to see you at many more of our webinars. Have a great day. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.